The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Loss in our lives takes on many different forms and can be more than just a physical loss. It goes beyond that to include emotional loss, business loss, and loss of personal health. This is Voices for Healing with Kathy Roberts. Today, Kathy and her guests will help you find out that you are not alone in dealing with loss and grief. There are so many different ways to deal with loss. What works for some may not work for others. Together, let's find the solution that you can use. Here's your host, Kathy Roberts. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Voices for Healing Talk Radio. I'm your host, Kathy Roberts. In my work as a professional counselor and educator in the Washington, D.C. area, I work with people living with and growing in response to all kinds of loss and change. You can learn more about me and my work on my website, kathyroberts.net, and from there we can connect on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and much more. You can also subscribe to Voices for Healing on iTunes and get regular podcast downloads. I want to acknowledge Pathways Magazine for their support of this program. Pathways is a free quarterly journal distributed throughout the Washington, D.C. area. Pick up a copy at your favorite library or health food store. The summer issue is now available. And for my listeners across the nation and around the globe, you can visit www.pathways.com and read the articles that are in this tremendous magazine online. Each week, this show features a guest who has expertise in some area of healing, loss, and finding opportunity in chaos. My wish for everyone listening is that you connect with some of what you hear on the shows and be inspired to use challenges to grow and become your most real, authentic self. Today, my guest, joining us via Skype from Paris, France, is Mark Matusek. Hello, Mark, and welcome to Voices for Healing Talk Radio. Hi, Kathy. It's great to be with you. It's really great to have you on the show. Let me let our audience know a little bit about you. Mark is the author of two award-winning memoirs, Sex, Death, Enlightenment, A True Story, and The Boy He Left Behind, A Man's Search for His Lost Father. He also wrote When Your Falling Dive, Lessons in the Art of Living, and his latest book is Ethical Wisdom, The Search for a Moral Life. A featured blogger on Psychology Today, Purple Clover, and Huffington Post, he's contributed to numerous anthologies and publications, including The New Yorker, O, The Oprah Magazine, where he was a contributing editor, The New York Times Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, Yoga Journal, Details, The Saturday Evening Post, AARP, Tricycle, The Buddhist Review, and many others. A popular lecturer and writing teacher, he's on the faculty of the New York Open Center, Omega Institute, the Mandala Center, Kripalu, Esalen, Hollyhock, and Mount Madonna. He's also the creative director of V-Men with Eve Ensler, an organization devoted to ending violence against women and girls. I'm really happy that Mark is able to join us today. Let me let you... Oh, go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead, Kathy. I was just saying thanks. Oh, Very good, and you're very, very welcome. In the hour ahead, we will explore how it is that some people turn adversity into fullness of life. When we're tossed into chaos, we can resist and deny what's happening for a while, but eventually to restore inner peace and balance, we need to accept what's happened, dig down deep to encounter grace, and learn to adapt. How do we make sense of the seemingly senseless tragedies in our personal and collective lives? While we may not have all the answers, we'll explore the questions and gather inspiration in our conversation with Mark today on Lessons in the Art of Living. In When You're Falling Dive, Mark writes, Our prevailing view of pain and loss as handicaps to be avoided at all cost is not only wrongheaded, but deeply ass backward. In fact, terror is fuel. Wounding is power. Darkness carries the seed of redemption. Authentic strength isn't found in our armor, but in the very pit of the wound each of us manages to survive. 
Mark, I thought we would just dive right in. There's such authenticity in your words. Can you tell us about the beginnings of your knowing about darkness carrying that seed of redemption that you write about so powerfully? Uh, sure, absolutely. I, I mean, I started writing when I was a very young kid. And what I discovered was that when I sat down to put people's stories down on paper, uh, and when I recorded my deep experience, my deep emotional uh, experience, uh, it had a redemptive quality to it. I felt like it wasn't wasted. You know, somehow if I could put it into a story, uh, and if I could bear witness to the suffering that I saw around me, uh, there was value in the experience. So that started at a very, very young age. Uh, and then later on, when I was uh, after I hit my own crisis in my uh, late 20s, I was working as an editor uh, in New York and I was living the high life. And all of a sudden uh, I had a death sentence given to me. Uh, and it was the thing that really woke me up. Uh, to the importance of finding grace, as you called it, finding strength, finding fuel uh, in very dark experience. Uh, and I spent about 10 years going into that experience of expecting uh, not to be here. Uh, and during that time, I, I became a spiritual seeker. Uh, and I also discovered to a much deeper degree the value, the redemptive aspect of of something like a uh, like like a death sentence, you know, facing one's mortality, facing enormous loss. And the value for me was that it got me out of my previous life. It got me on the road. It got me asking questions. And it really gave me my work as as a writer. So I discovered uh, even, you know, even deeper that uh, that the experiences that I was going through were not only um, something to be put up with, but were actually the shaping events of my life and that they would make me into the person that I would become. Uh, I was aware that I was getting I was I, I was uh, character was forming at a deeper level than than had ever happened before. And that to me is is the greatest redemption. You know, what it, what whatever it takes to wake you up is grace. Uh, and often those things are painful. Those things can be uh, catastrophic even. But if it breaks your story open and, it, and if it lets in the light of other possibilities, then the experience won't be wasted. And that to me is the, the greatest redemption, just realizing in loss that your open, that loss is a portal to something else. That as someone in When You're Falling Dive said to me, no matter what's happening to you, something else is also true. You know, experience has a doubleness to it. Uh, and so when you when you get that and you've been through enough scares, enough losses, enough grief, uh, and, and realize that you can move through that with open eyes and actually expanding as a human being, it gives you enormous courage and, and, it, and it makes you realize that that uh, that every experience, almost every experience can be used for this you know, it can be used uh, to wake up, can be used uh, as grist for the mill. The, the experiences that I would I would exempt from that, Kathy, would just be uh, ex uh, uh, physical torture and extreme physical pain. I, I don't mm -hmm. think there's any any redemption for that. Mm. I, I like that you qualify that you when you talked about expecting not to be here, that really struck me. I think most of us don't think about that very much. We live our lives day to day thinking that tomorrow will be much like today and yesterday and don't have that sense of mortality that you had at a fairly young age, I guess maybe in your 20s or yeah, in your 20s, I guess is when that came up for you. And I, the way you said it was very powerful, expecting not to be here. And the um, value that that gave to you as you began to appreciate the being here? It's really everything. I mean, I, 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 until we know that we're not going to be here forever, we can't fully engage in our lives as they are uh, in, the, in the present moment. You know, unless you admit the fragility and the impermanence of this experience, uh, you won't push yourself to to live uh, to to understand, to grow, to do all the things that that we don't have forever to do, uh, and and what you're saying is is actually pro quite profound. It's the absence of an awareness of mortality that holds a lot of people in uh, actually very dark places. A lot of depression comes from this sense of uh, ennui and tomorrow is the same as today. And whereas if we wake up. If we just turn around and look around us and realize, my gosh, this 
moment will never, ever come again. Uh, and I am here for an instant. That will, you know, that will uh, make you pay attention and, and wake you up. So, so the, the paradox, of course, is that the thing that we resist the most, the thing that's scariest for us, is the very thing that gives us our wisdom. It's the thing that gives us our, our strength uh, and, and our depth. I, I work with many older adults, and often this is an area that uh, they, we, as I cross over into that um, age group as well, are beginning to grapple with in a newer way as we become um, the the oldest generation in our family as we move towards that. And I like what you said about these events, these thoughts, these recognitions we have are the shaping events of our life and they build character. And that's one thing I like to share with everybody of every age. It's it's never too late to be using these things that are happening around us in our lives, be moved by them, be touched by them, be broken open by them to uh, create character, to create strength, to create something new in our own lives. Can you comment? That, oh, that's absolutely true. It's now it is never too late. Uh, and and part of the part of the waste of time that, that, that we can fall into is is regret over why didn't I know this before? You know, why did it take me 50 years to realize that I, you know, that I was you know, going to die and that I better pay attention? It doesn't matter. I mean, the past is dead and gone. Uh, it's never, ever too late. Uh, and the, the thing that this does is it changes the quality of your life profoundly. So for the person who's, say, 70 or 80 years old and saying, why bother now? Well, the reason to bother is that having this recognition, having this deep spiritual awareness of the, of the uh, brevity and the beauty of, of a human life will, will change the, 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 the time that you have you know, it, radically. Uh, you, you will find yourself connecting with people on a much deeper level. You'll find yourself savoring your existence at a much, much deeper level. It will also give you gratitude, which, I mean, as you know, is, is the antidote to self-pity. Self-pity is very easy to fall into as we, as we, as we age, uh, and, and gratitude is the antidote to that. It's saying, you know, as long as I'm here, I'm grateful for this experience. Uh, and, and that that I think is the blessing our our existence, you know, whatever, you know, even with physical limitation uh, is something that that we can all do uh, at any time. Yeah, I think when we can turn those regrets, you mentioned regret, which I think a, a lot of people, myself sometimes included, experience. And when we know that we're into that place of regret, when we can turn it into appreciation for something that has happened, something that's grown out of that, something that we recognize that we didn't before. I remember when I first got into the counseling field, I was older, and many of the people who were counselors were you know, a lot younger than me, 15, 20 years even. And I felt like I had missed so much by not getting into it sooner. But the mm -hmm. truth was, I was is bringing something different by getting into it later and having different life experiences leading up to it. And I think when we can look at things from that perspective and sort of turn that regret on its head, acknowledge it, yes, and then um, kind of flip it in some way, then we can have a different relationship with ourselves around it. And I think that's really important, too. Oh, completely. Yeah, it's the angle of vision, as Emerson said. It's the, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Wallace Stevens said. It's the angle of vision that we have on our lives that determines how we live and what we see. You're absolutely right. You just reframe that and you say, oh, well, there's something that I lost, but there's something that I gained. All of a sudden, that experience is, is transformed for you. Yeah, and we can do that anytime, any way, in any age when we have that attitude. I think there's something about developing the attitude to know that's a possibility. Do you I, have some I, thoughts yes, on I, that? Yes, Kathy. I, I mean, I, I I really do agree. That's that of, of all, when, all those years of seeking that I was talking about, and when I was expecting that I wasn't going to be here. The one thing, the major, the the, the biggest shift in my awareness was that. Uh, suffering, grief, loss, all of these things that as a depressive <laughs> that I was and an atheist depressive cynic that I was, I thought had no value. When I realized that they were actually fuel for, uh, for, a, better, for a higher purpose, fuel for awakening, uh, fuel for wisdom, it changed everything for me. Life went from being kind of a nihilistic uh, experience where you, you suffer inevitable loss, uh, but there's no value to it. 
to 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 life being a, a school, you know, and an education that that includes painful lessons, but where nothing is wasted, where nothing needs to be wasted, uh, if we are paying attention, uh, and 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 if we you know if we use what we learn uh, to to change, to wake up, and to connect to other people. Yeah, I think that's important, and I also as you talked about um, life being a school. And I was thinking about how many, many people, um, and I usually count myself in among the many people at some point or another. I've often had these experiences myself. But sometimes uh, we think that there is an end point. Like we reach a level of enlightenment or a level of knowing, and at that point, life is blissful and everything feels wonderful and we don't have problems anymore. And <laughs> I, yeah, isn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I, I, I like that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's a finish line. And when we get to that finish line, then, you know, everything is bliss. And and what I often remind myself and people I work with and people I'm, I'm talking to is that, you know, some of um, the the people who I think are really pretty highly developed and enlightened have um, one thing after another that goes on that they get to adapt to and learn from and truly be in this school of life when both the wonderful, joyous things are happening that we're celebrating and when the things are happening that we're not really that keen on having happen, but they're there. So can we can we go with them rather than resist them? So... Absolutely. I mean, enlightenment, uh, quote unquote, is an ongoing experience. It's not an there's no end point. Uh, and if you spend time around any spiritual teacher, you know what I'm talking about. They have their faults. They have their foibles. They have their bad days. They have their moods. They have their tastes. They have their personalities. Uh, and that's the beauty of it is with, with a, a real spiritual master is you see within this broken vessel, within this, you know, crooked human form, you see this light shining clearly through. That's the beauty. But it's the contrast between, that it's coming through not a perfect form, but a, a human form that's still in progress. That's what's so poignant about about being around real teachers. Uh, and, and, and on another level, all of us in our lives are, 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 we have enlightenment moments and then we slip back and then we have big wake ups and then we go into, you know, we go into a turnaround. What I have found though is that the, the relapse time is shorter, you know, that I catch myself when I sort of slide into uh, mindlessness and oblivion, I, I catch myself more quickly. Uh, and my friend Sharon Salzberg, uh, who's a wonderful meditation teacher, is always saying that every moment that you realize that you're not paying attention is a moment of enlightenment. I love that. It's very humble and it's very human. It's a, it's a remembering and returning kind of yes. cycle, I think, where you... And it's almost, um, what just came to me, it's almost like it's in that moment that you wake up a little more when you remember that you're not paying attention and then you return to paying attention. <laughs> it's, um, it's a little bit of a wake up. Yes, it is. And you, you, we use that muscle of awakening. We strengthen that muscle of, of mindfulness every time we, we have one of those wake up moments. So the next time you, you know, you, you will catch yourself more quickly. Um, and the thing is to have a sense of humor about it, to recognize that you're always going to have backslides. You're always going to have bad days. It's never, ever perfect. You never achieve this, this, uh, this complete uh, permanent bliss. Uh, and why should you? You know, you're, we're human beings and this is samsara, you know, and we're doing the best we can. And it's a gorgeous experience, but it's not a perfect experience. Yeah. In in your book, um, When You're Falling Dive, you talk about your work with Ram Das, and he spoke with you about the parts of him that weren't cooked yet, the parts that were still developing and still growing. And I think that's what we're talking about now, that there's still chaos and challenges that get to shine that spotlight on those parts of us that um, we might not feel good about what's happening, but it's a gift and, and we continue to grow through them, even whoever we are, even when um, it's Sharon Salzberg or Ram Das or um, another spiritual teacher who is a household name. Oh, I mean, exactly. And one of the things that I respect so much about Ram Das and, and is proof to me of his, of his spiritual you know, wisdom and maturity is that he was willing to recognize the parts of himself that weren't cooked yet, to cop to them with humility and a lot of humor uh, and let himself be changed. 
Uh, I, I, met, I would spend time with Ram Dass uh, doing a book uh, right after he had his stroke, and he was in a lot of resistance to that uh, condition, and I'm not telling tales out of school to, to say that. It was very, very hard. I can tell you now, 12 or 13 years down the line, he has learned to be taken care of in a way he had never been able to do before, and those uncooked parts that, that he was talking about have indeed become cooked. So he, he is a deeper, fuller, more, more complete uh, human being now. And I like thinking of us in the, that way as being uncooked. Sometimes I've used that myself, talking about, you know, I'm not cooked yet, or telling somebody else, none of us are cooked yet. We're still, <laughs> we're still works in process. You know, we're those, you know, 90, maybe year old, year long turkey lives that it takes us that long <laughs> to cook in this lifetime before we go on to something else. So, yes, yeah. it yeah. does. It takes us, it takes us time to cook. Yeah. Mark, we're coming up on a break, and now sounds like a good uh, good time to take that break. So um, self-realization is not for sissies. Transformation comes at a cost. We may be shattered and freed by hardship eventually, but the process requires a stomach for change. Yet practice teaches us, in spite of ourselves, that even the most destructive forces are harnessable to constructive ends. Pain we would prefer to avoid can be used as a battering ram for unearthing the true and beautiful. These words from Mark's book. It's time for a break. We will be right back. Think you've seen everything there is to see in online television? Let us surprise you. Visit voiceamerica.tv today for sports, health, business, and more on demand 24-7. Kathy Roberts is not only an exceptional radio host, she's an exceptional listener and counselor. Kathy appeals to motivated, high-functioning people to help them improve their health and vitality. Kathy can meet you where you are and help you identify what you want. Visit Kathy's website at www.kathyroberts.net or call her at 301-651-0019. Kathy works with both individuals and couples and specializes in grief and depression counseling. Get to know yourself by working with Kathy. Visit kathyroberts.net or call 301-651-0019. Kathy Roberts offers Circle of Voices teleclasses to help you focus your mind, engage your energy, and awaken your inner guide. Through this experiential and interactive series, you will know yourself more and learn to express yourself authentically in your personal life. Visit Kathy's website at kathyroberts.net to find out about this teleclass series designed to open you to change and engage healing in the fabric of your life. Go to kathyroberts.net. Or call Kathy at 301-651-0019 for more information. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. You are listening to Voices for Healing with your host, Kathy Roberts. If you have a question or comment for the program, please send an email to kathy at kathyroberts.net. That's kathy at kathyroberts.net. Now back to Voices for Healing. Welcome back to Voices for Healing. I'm Kathy Roberts, and my guest today is Mark Matusik. And our topic is When You Are Falling Dive, Lessons in the Art of Living. Mark, the title of your book lets me know that you're committed to leaning into the opportunities that crisis brings. How are you able to imagine your life in a new way when you are going through some difficult time? That's a, such a great question, and it's a complex question because there are times right after, a, a, let's say, a loss or, or a bit of you know, hard news or when we can't expect ourselves to be able to reimagine anything and we need to just allow ourselves to be and to stop and to to uh, adapt to uh, to whatever our new situation is and get comfortable with it, not sort of push ourselves to, you know, to you know, what can I make of this or, or anything like that prematurely. Uh, that's as bad as as premature forgiveness or as as unskillful and, you know, and futile. Uh, so the first thing you do is to allow the news of what your new situation is to to be. Let it be there. Uh, and then as you grieve, because usually there's a grief process that goes 
uh, goes on after we've you know had some some major shock or, or trauma. You know, then as we look forward, we need to start to uh, in, be to to develop the capacity to imagine ourselves differently, to see our stories differently uh, than they were in the past. That's one of the key things that everyone said to me in, in, in When You're Falling Dive that I interviewed. And these were great survivors of various in many different uh, situations. Uh, but many of them repeated the fact that if you can't see yourself differently, if you think things are ever going to go back to the way they were before, you cannot grow, you can't be transformed. And, and you can very often get stuck in this uh, this this pit of, of what if and why me. Uh, so if we want to move past that, once it's time, and we, we tend to know when we've done enough grieving, we tend to know when we have you know come to a place where, you know, okay, now what? Uh, even though we, we're still depressed, even though we're still, you know, beaten up or, or, or whatever the, the case may be, there's a part of us that's saying, okay, now what? To allow the imagination to envision a new future, you know, to say, who am I now? Instead of demanding, uh, imposing our ideas on the future, say, who am I? Uh, you talked about leaning in, Kathy, and, and a big part of this is surrender, surrendering to the unknown. You know, creativity comes from the unknown. It comes from what we don't know. Uh, so to enter an, a period of, of, of loss or great change is to enter a deeply creative uh, moment. Uh, but creative moments are not always pleasant. I mean, they can feel really hard. They can feel really confusing, confusing and, and like we're being, you know, we're being stretched. Uh, so to understand that reinvention and transformation is a creative spiritual process uh, that takes time, number one, and that may involve uh, periods of discomfort will help us uh, surrender to our experience uh, more deeply and, and, and more, more creatively. Uh, if, if we're expecting it to be easy, if we're expecting things to go back to the way they were, um, then we're, we are, uh, we're in for a big surprise. You know, then that's just, that becomes an argument with reality. You know, we first have to face what is. Uh, we have to get comfortable, as comfortable with the discomfort of what is as we can do, uh, and then start to, start to imagine, okay, well, if that wasn't to be, if that story's over, uh, what, what is my new story? And part of this, part of this, and everyone who's been through a crisis knows this, you, you realize that you're living a story when something major happens to change it. You say, well, gosh, I'm not who I was at all. That narrative was just a narrative that I was going to live happily ever after. It wasn't the truth. So that change from I am my story to I had a story and now I'm creating a new story is a, is a seminal change. That's a watershed moment uh, in, in awakening for all of us to realize that our stories are something that we create. We're, we're making ourselves up at every moment. You know, every life is a work of fiction. Uh, and to really grasp the creativity uh, that's inherent in, in, in that, uh, it gives us a lot of power when we don't know how to, how to change. That's really one of the most important parts, I think, is that sense of creativity within us. I often think of uh, the concept of security and think about how, you know, there really isn't security out, outside of us. There's things and people have lost all kinds of things that they thought they would have forever, whether it's money or a home or a, an individual a person they love or whatever. And the real security, I think, is what is within us. And that security is about creativity, I believe, and the creativity that we have to adapt and deal and change and move on and reinvent whatever happens in our external world. That's beautifully said. That's exactly, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, creativity is our power. You know, Dostoevsky said, man is the animal that can adapt to anything. And it's true. You know, it's, it's I'm sure you've had that in your life where you thought, gosh, I can never live with this. And then, you know, a few months down the line, it's become ho-hum. We have an enormous power of creativity. We're shapeshifters. We're protean. Uh, and, and change and transformation is, is inherent to who we are. And once you get that and you get that that is your power, you don't feel like if you lose what's go what you have now, there will be nothing. You get that there will be other things and you just don't know what they are yet. And, and you stay open to them. 
Yeah, and the the fear sometimes comes in about that not knowing. I think there's a tremendous amount of fear that can arise when we don't know or when something happens and it shakes up what we thought we were going to have. And yet, even when we have that experience of fear and move through that, that can garner a, a, something new in our lives as well. Yes, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and your your attitude toward not knowing, one's attitude toward not knowing, uh, may be the largest factor that determines how we live. You know, if you can't live with, if we, if if, if you have trouble living with uncertainty, uh, you're going to have trouble living in this world. You know, if you have trouble with not knowing, then your life uh, can may become a, a sort of a fear reaction against that. So we build up all these false ideas of security only to eventually have them torn down too. You know, so getting comfortable with, uh, with discomfort, the discomfort of not knowing, uh, is key to the kind of creative, reinventive uh, process we're talking about uh, around loss. And it's also key to a spiritual life because a spiritual life is about constant discovery. It's not about knowing. It's about discovering. It's about what the Zen Buddhists call beginner's mind. Beginner's mind is knowing that every moment is starting anew. It has never happened before. And if we, when we start to see our lives that way, it's very exciting and it's very creative, but it's not um, conclusive. You know, that is, a, that is a state of not knowing. And that state of not knowing doesn't have to be terrifying. You know, if we have a sense of trust in ourselves, our powers of creativity, and also in life, that there is something in life that is moving us forward. There's something larger than us that moves us forward, uh, whether that's a religious faith or it's just a sense of, of being a part of the cosmos that is so great. You know, that, that gives us a lot of, of strength to, to get through the, you know, the times of uncertainty when, when we want to grab onto something. We want to grab onto certainty, and it just isn't there. Yeah. Yeah, as you were talking and using the words creativity and discovery, I could feel a kind of excitement arising from my belly. And I think of the power of words and how we use them and how we think about things. And when we're talking about fear, there's more of a constriction and a, a, a moving inward. But as we realize that these things that happen in our life do require us to do what you, you said, to take time to grieve, to take time to adapt, but also to have a, a kind of inner knowing that something's working through here and it's bigger than us and we don't know what it is and what might it be. And there can be a kind of excitement in the creativity and discovery of what's going to happen next, you know, what, what's yes. going to happen today. And that can put a different frame on it than the, the, the smallness that is another way that we can think about things. Yeah, it's, I, it's, it's a completely different frame. Absolutely. Yeah. I was hoping maybe you could share with us one of the stories from your book, When You're Falling Dive, and kind of, um, well, I mean, maybe put a frame around what we're talking about. Perhaps one of the people that you interviewed, and we can share with our listeners the process that they went through from that initial denial or grief or anger or whatever the initial parts were to ha having new life come out of the ashes of their um of their situation. Is there one you might like to share with us? Sure, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the book uh, is to do with a guy named Jack Willis. Um, Jack Willis and his fiance Mary were on the beach in Southampton uh, when he was in his late twenties, uh, and he took a wave uh, and hit his neck, broke his neck, and was immediately paralyzed from uh, from the neck down. Um, he and his wife, he and Mary were about to be married. Uh, his whole life obviously flashed in front of his eyes. He, he, uh, they, they saved him. It, it turned out that the, um, the spinal cord wasn't broken, so he did uh, get back some of his mobility. But it was a very, very long, torturous road back. He went through serious depression. Who am I now? How can I have a career? Uh, how can I make my wife uh, how can I be a good husband? Um, and how can I have kids? All of those things were suddenly taken away from him. Uh, and Jack went through several years of, of feeling very sorry for himself, feeling very, very lost. Uh, and what came out of that was uh, a spiritual awakening and an awakening to the power of self that is as dramatic and beautiful as I've ever seen in another human being. He realized that if Mary, his wife, wasn't going to leave him because of this. If she, she still wanted to, to marry him, which she did, 
um, then maybe he needed to figure out how to how to uh, how to live. And so he determined to live as normally and as happily as as he could. He ended up having a fantastic career uh, and two children and one of the strongest you know, most uh, you know, marriages between equals that I've ever seen. Uh, and then when he was in his 60s, he's now, uh, Jack is about 77, uh, when he was in his 60s, uh, he discovered meditation because he, he was finding that as um, determined as he was and as, as you know, well-adjusted as he was, there was still an inner anxiety and turmoil in him that he wanted to address. So he, in his 60s, began to meditate and has had from that, uh, yeah, a deeper uh, healing into awareness of his own suffering, the ways that he had been in denial about his accident. So he continued to evolve. Uh, he has continued to evolve in the 50 years since this accident. And what you see now, what you meet now when you see Jack, he's, he's, a, he's, like, he's, the, uh, he's the, blo the blooming of a human being. I mean, you just, you, you, this man has such grace and beauty and strength and humor uh, he has more life in him at 77, uh, crippled, <laughs> uh, than most of the people I know who, you know, ha half his age who, uh, who are of sound body. So it, it, to me, is proof of what can happen uh, when you look at what you look at your inner condition, uh, you do the inside work uh, as well as the uh, external healing, uh, and you, you find something in your life that you love. He realized, he, I mean, he loved his fiance he wanted to stay and later his wife he wanted to stay uh, alive so that they could have their uh, their their life together and, and that was the thing so it was a path of love uh, and I, I just find it so inspiring and so beautiful uh, as, as a story of someone who who, who overcame the, just the worst uh, to have this magnificent life it, that is a beautiful story and an, a really amazing one. I was thinking as you were talking about it of all of the soldiers who are coming home from our wars whose bodies are um, damaged um, and so different than how they were when they went over and how many of them have such inspirational stories as well. One um, is a, a comedian. Um, he's a local guy from Baltimore, I believe, and lost both legs, and he's a comedian now. And others are really, uh, when we think about it, can really inspire us to reach beyond what we think is possible for ourselves and our lives and whatever um, losses we have. I, I think all losses are significant. Sometimes people will say, yes, but he lost a leg and all I did was lose my job or something like that. But yeah. all losses impact us very powerfully and we all go through the same process of healing from them, whether it's a, a minor loss that you might forget about in a year or something like Jack's that will impact you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That's an important, such an important point, Kathy, because people disqualify their own pain. They disqualify their own suffering uh, by comparing it to people who have it worse off. Uh, and, and I know that that's supposed to be a strengthening thing to do. But in fact, what it does is separates us from our from our experience. It separates us from our own pain. Uh, so it separates us from our own healing. You know, my mom used to say, you know, I, I cried because I had no shoes till I saw the man who had no feet, you know, and I thought, wow, that's so that's so deep. And then I thought, well, I still don't have any shoes, though. <laughs> you know, it's like right. it, it, or as, as someone else said, um, you know, a blind man steps on your foot. It still hurts. You know what I mean? It doesn't it, it doesn't disqualify your experience um, just because it's not as bad as someone else's. Someone else will always have it worse, worse off than you. But but recognize it, recognizing it, as you said, as as human suffering. This is suffering and it comes in all these different forms and we all share a measure of it. Right. And I think by doing that, sometimes we can minimize our own pain and suffering and act like it's not important because somebody else's is so much greater. But the truth is, whatever it is for us is important to us in that moment. And I think that's why it's important to recognize it and acknowledge it and find a way to move through it in a way that you have more and greater joy or greater ease afterwards for a time. Because yeah. otherwise, I, I think we're, um, I, I can't remember if you used the word dismissive, but I, I think that's what it can be for us is dismissive of ourselves. 
Yeah, we, it, it is. And there is another thing that happens, and I'm sure you've seen this in your work, uh, is that we, we, we tell ourselves that what was happening with us isn't so bad as a way of feeling um, less bad. Uh, when yes. we're, and looking at people uh, worse off than ourselves in a kind of pitying way instead of with compassion uh, that can connect us in a pitying way where we say, oh, well, gosh, I'm fine. Look at them. You know, you, you remember, and, and it's like, I'm okay, you're not. So uh -huh. to look at the part of us that wants to protect ourselves from the fact that we, that, that our pain is the pain and that we share it with all of the human beings and that we're not any better off, you know, ultimately than, than, than anybody else is, is a very humbling thing to do. And, and it helps a lot with the, you know, the process that we're talking about. Beautifully said, beautifully said. We're coming up on time for another break. So stay with us for more When You're Falling Dive, Lessons in the Art of Living with Mark Matusek. We will be right back. Your favorite Voice America Talk Radio Network shows and hosts are in your car, outdoors, and wherever you need them to be. Listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Kathy Roberts offers Circle of Voices teleclasses to help you focus your mind, engage your energy, and awaken your inner guide. Through this experiential and interactive series, you will know yourself more and learn to express yourself authentically in your personal life. Visit Kathy's website at kathyroberts.net to find out about this teleclass series designed to open you to change and engage healing in the fabric of your life. Go to kathyroberts.net or call Kathy at 301-651-0019 for more information. Kathy Roberts is not only an exceptional radio host, she's an exceptional listener and counselor. Kathy appeals to motivated, high-functioning people to help them improve their health and vitality. Kathy can meet you where you are and help you identify what you want. Visit Kathy's website at www.kathyroberts.net or call her at 301-651-0019. Kathy works with both individuals and couples and specializes in grief and depression counseling. Get to know yourself by working with Kathy. Visit kathyroberts.net or call 301-651-0019. Your favorite Voice America Talk Radio Network shows and hosts are in your car, outdoors, and wherever you need them to be. Listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. You are listening to Voices for Healing with your host, Kathy Roberts. If you have a question or comment for the program, please send an email to kathy at kathyroberts.net. That's kathy at kathyroberts.net. Now back to Voices for Healing. Listeners, welcome back to Voices for Healing. I'm talking to Mark Matusek about When You Are Falling Dive, Lessons in the Art of Living. One of the quotes from that book is, We cannot transform what we have not blessed. Blessing is an acknowledgement, an acceptance. The complex act of acceptance allows us to change. As we head into this, the final segment of our program, I'd like for Mark to have a chance to share with our listeners his latest book and any upcoming events and projects he has going. Mark, can you share some of what's going on with you? Oh, sure, Kathy. Uh, my last book was uh, called Ethical Wisdom for Friends. Uh, I had written Ethical Wisdom as a kind of overview about moral science and whether what makes us good. And someone said, well, you didn't really apply that to any kind of human behavior in real situations. So I decided to do a series. And the first one is all about friendship uh, and how we behave in friendship and friendship being one of the great underestimated uh, affairs of the heart in most of our lives. So I really go into uh, friendship and the question of of, of how we how we connect. Uh, so that's a uh, that was my last book, uh, and what I have coming up uh, immediately in two weeks, I have a, an online class coming up called Passion and Abandon: Life Unhooked. Uh, I do these six to six, some six weeks, some nine week online courses. That uh, where where uh, students get a um, get an assignment uh, a week uh, and 
read each other's work and read my responses to each other. I respond every week and they become very intimate communities. So I would love to encourage people to visit my website, which is www.markmatousek.com. Uh, visit uh, visit my site, become a part of my community. I, I have all kinds of uh, courses and events coming up, uh, and it would be uh, just great to connect with you. That's great. Thanks for sharing more about you with our listeners. One of the things that you said as you were talking about Jack's story as he um, began to find a reason for living fully after his really devastating accident was he was in love with his fiance and now wife and finding something that you love can really be part of what transports you from the grief to fullness of life. Can you share a little more about that? Maybe uh, some commonalities that some of the people you um, interviewed had in terms of finding love, finding their passion. Sure, absolutely. And, and, and love is intimately connected to meaning, of course. And finding meaning in suffering, finding meaning in darkness, in times of loss, uh, is sometimes the hardest challenge that people are facing. You know, what did it mean? What can I make it mean? And what does my life mean now uh, in this changed form? So uh, love and meaning are intimately connected and finding something that we love, uh, both internally and externally, you know, can carry us through the, the times when we feel worthless, we feel beaten down or we feel like we feel like victims. Um, there are two stories that come to mind when you when you brought that up. The first is Viktor Frankl, of course, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning uh, when he was in Auschwitz. It was the thought that his wife might be alive in another camp. Uh, that got him through and gave his life meaning, enabled him to survive at Auschwitz. And, of course, Frankel went on to uh, found the school of psychotherapy called Logotherapy, which is all about finding meaning. Uh, and what he said is that despair equals suffering minus meaning. So mm -hmm. suffering without any meaning is what sinks us. If we can find meaning in the experience... Uh, then we will not fall into despair. We will move into that creative zone that, that we were talking about before. Um, and the second story that I wanted to mention is it has to do with the great Indian teacher, Ramakrishna. Someone came to Ramakrishna, this was the late 19th century, uh, saying that he had no love for God. Uh, he, couldn't he couldn't connect to God in any way, to the divine. And Ramakrishna asked the man who, what he loved in his life. Uh, and he said, well, I love my little, I think it was his niece. Uh, Ramakrishna then said, then, then love your niece as a, as, a, uh, as a piece of God, as a representation of God. Uh, and that love will take you uh, to, to spiritual fulfillment. Um, and so that's connected for me, too, that love will take us to the heart of our lives. It will, it will take us to what it is that, that saves us in, in, in the salvational sense of saves us from, from despair and from darkness. You know, we have to find what we love and, and, and gravitate toward it and, and steer ourselves toward it. Uh, in order to in order to make the suffering, make the challenge uh, worthwhile in some way to to give ourselves heart. Another piece of this that I, I'm always saying to people is that morale is extremely important. Morale is the emotional reservoir that we draw on to to make these changes. So pay attention to your morale. Keep your morale up whatever that may mean to you on a given day. If it means taking a walk, if it means going to a movie, if it means reading a book or meditating, whatever it is that fills that reservoir uh, of morale will be fuel to that, that, that you know, helps us you know, move, move toward love in our lives and move toward the thing that's going to you know, make, it, make it all worthwhile for us. This You're talking about morale and finding those things that really give our life meaning and keeping our morale up reminds me of uh, the uh, in your book. At one point, you say we need more definitions of happiness. Mm -hmm. And you talk about happiness being maybe a kind of we have a narrow definition of that. But if we talk about fullness and intensity of existence, that is another kind of happiness as well. And when you talk about morale, I, I think of that. Mm. And um, 
And yeah, ha happiness and happiness includes grief. You know, happiness includes darkness. Uh, you know, it's the difference between something that's pleasant and something that gives you joy. Joy may may, may very well include you know gravitas uh, as well as just just lightness. So. Yeah, we do. We need we need to widen our definition of happiness so that it includes the inevitable losses and changes that come in our lives. I mean, it's all well and good. It's easy to be happy and cheerful when things are going well. But how do we stand in the mess? You know, how do we stand in the in the in the brokenness when when we're and, and find sustenance and find a sense of of self and a, and a sense of worthwhileness? How can we be happy then? Uh, before everything is resolved, that's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Because you know, nothing is ever completely resolved, and there's always something. Uh, and we we need to know how to stand in that and be happy. And well, I want to add to that. With you mentioned Andrew Solomon, you tell his story in your book. And about six months ago, I came across a quote of his somewhere else, where he said, "The opposite of depression is not happiness, but vitality." Mm -hmm. And I really like that word and that use of the word because, like you, I, 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 I happiness can seem limited to me. I don't think what you said um, was really great and and uh, pushed me a little bit when you said we can find we happiness is grief, happiness is something else. I can't remember exactly what your words were because it was hitting some sort of little disconnect in my brain, so I couldn't really follow what you were saying at that point, because I'm thinking, well, how's that? You know, mm. happiness seems to, and this is my own construct that I'm sure, you know, happiness seems to be kind of emotion that we have when we like what's happening, when things are going our way, when we're feeling um, good and generous and full. And, um, uh, and so that's, that's my construct. And I, I think of um, vitality or what you were talking about morale is something that we can bring to whatever is happening. We can we can bring that to grief. We can bring that to pain. We can bring that to some kind of hurt or anger. And it, it's about what exactly what you were saying with morale, having that energy to meet what's happening now, or having that energy to know what we want to do to help ourselves out on this given day. Yeah. But I loved what you said about the happiness. In I, I want to know more about that. Can you say a little more about Happiness is grief too. Well, what I yeah, absolutely. What I said was that happiness includes grief. Happiness um, includes grief. It includes grief. So let's say um, let's say you uh, you have a you lost you lose you suffer the loss of a spouse um, for the rest of your life. You will have a measure of grief, sadness, missing, wistfulness, bittersweetness toward the spouse. But that doesn't mean that you can, your life can't be happy. It includes that experience. It's part of what that shadow experience is part of what gives you and your life character. You know, so when we see it, instead of trying for perfection and, and a happy life means never losing anything, when we see it in the way that Andrew's talking about or see it in the sense of deep engagement, that doesn't that's not um, just, you know, just hearts and flowers, you know, that that that's all of life. You know, a word that I love, I got it from E.E. E. Cummings is gladness. You know, he talks about you shall you shall above all things be glad and young. And that to me is the, the, the spirit of, of happiness that, that I mean, glad to be here with all of the limitations, all the uncertainties, all the fears and losses and, and, and stuff to be glad to be here. That's that's what I that's what I aspire to. And that, that's what I'm trying to talk about. That's beautiful. And when you said happiness includes grief and you talked about it again, what I also heard in the example you gave of the grieving spouse was the happiness that that person will have in the future. But also the the happiness that they had that they are now grieving. I mean, if, if we're grieving, yeah. then we've had something that we lost that we loved or that we still love. And so to be in touch with, with that as well. And that brings us to that word doubleness that you used at the beginning of our conversation. And I want to come back to that because it sounds like when something we have we'll have about two minutes maybe for this it sounds like when something is happening whatever we think is true there's also something else that's true is that yes. what you mean by doubleness 
Yes, exactly what I mean by doubleness. And, and I'm sure you've had, and most people listening to this have had the experience of going through something that feels like just the worst thing or, or something, let's just say something that is, is unwanted. Uh, that may end up turning into a, a boon in your life. It may end up guiding you in a, in a, in a direction you might not have taken, uh, taken otherwise. So that what is good fortune and bad fortune becomes very paradoxical in this, in this game. Uh, and as, as, you know, as you know, when you go through an experience that, that is hard, the mind can kind of narrow and feel like this is it. Uh, it becomes sort of monolithically bad. Uh, or, 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 you know, or tragic or whatever it might be. When in fact, as time goes on, and if we keep our minds open and our eyes open, what we realize is that there are many different, many um, dimensions to what happens to us and that we can, as we were saying earlier, use them uh, in, in, in very creative ways. Uh, so that's part of the doubleness. You know, something else is also true. Uh, you may be losing your spouse and that may uh, give you enormous compassion for other widows, which may lead you to doing work that may give you tremendous fulfillment. You know what I'm saying? So absolutely. That's the way it is. That's that's been my experience. Yeah. And now we've cycled around. We're going to um, end here in a minute, but we've cycled around to what we talked about earlier, which is the uncertainty. When something occurs, we can't know for sure whether ultimately this thing is going to be as difficult and challenging as it looks in the moment or whether it's going to always feel as bad as it does right now. Probably won't, especially when we have the attitude that we can transform regularly. Mark, we're going to need to come to a close here. I'm wondering if you could hold on the line for just a moment when we end. Will you be able to sure. do that? Of course. Great. Sure. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. My pleasure, Kathy. Our hour has passed quickly, and I hope our listeners are inspired to move headfirst into all that life brings their way. I hope you will join me next week. Guest Rick Hansen, neuropsychologist and author of Buddha's Brain and Hardwiring Happiness, among other books, will be with us sharing his latest research on the plasticity of the brain and how, we, and how we can focus our minds to change our brains for greater peace, compassion, and happiness. Until then, this is Kathy Roberts. Transform yourself. Embrace vitality. We'll be back next week. Thank you for listening to Voices for Healing. Please join Kathy Roberts again next Monday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We wish you the best recovery from your loss, and we'll talk again next week.